Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christchurch on this almost sunny Sunday. Yeah. Has everyone enjoyed the rain? Yes. You have? Well, I, we've come back after four days away and I just mowed the lawn and I came back and it's back to ankle height. So that'll be my job this afternoon. Welcome to Christchurch. My name's Alex. I'll be leading the service this morning. Uh, welcome if it's your first time or you've been coming here for years. This is Teddy, my son. You're right. Yeah, okay. Um, we're here today to worship the Lord um, all ages together. Uh, we do have pressure on for little ones. If you're getting a bit stressed or if they're getting a bit stressed, then the pressure's through the doors and the toilets and all that kind of stuff is that way. Um, for the younger people, we don't have the groups on because it's summer Sundays, but there is a little sheet to kind of help during the talk to get them to think about what we're going to share later on. Um, there is a little video to kind of give us the theme for today. Okay, we're, we're in the Summer Sunday series on the Pentateuch. Just easy reading, nothing too difficult, you know. Um, and today we're going to look at Leviticus, which is my favourite book of the whole Bible. Um, so your attention to the screens. Uh... We've already gone through Genesis and Exodus. The next book is called Leviticus. Leviticus picks up right where Exodus left off, with even more instructions on how to be holy. So what does the word holy mean? Got it. The word holy means full of holes, as in my socks are very holy. I used it in a sentence in everything. Yes, you did. That's a different kind of holy. Pastor Paul, can you help us out? The word holy means dedicated to or set apart for God. To be holy is to be set apart for God. I set apart these mashed potatoes to eat later. They are holy. No, Captain Pete, that isn't quite right. To be holy, something must be set apart for God. Those mashed potatoes are for you. That might make them yummy, but it doesn't make them holy. Sorry, potatoes. I thought that would just wet your appetites. Uh, let, let's stand together. As we come together as a church family to rededicate our lives in service to God, as we, as we come forward saying, Lord, you are holy, I want to be holy too. And one of the ways that we can do that is, is worshipping him. So we're going we're gonna to sing a few songs together of worship and songs to the Lord. And as we sing them, just... Just welcome his presence in. Welcome him in to your heart. Let him speak to you as we worship him. And Father, we thank you that we are able to meet together as your children. Lord, you are holy, you are worthy. We stand amazed in your presence. Father, I accept these songs we sing as an indication of our love to you. Amen. Amen. So let us worship together. <coughs> Thank you. 
Let's just wait on the Lord for a moment. Some, but when we wait on him and when we rest in his presence, the more that we can bow down, the more that we can see and hear what he is saying and what he's doing. And I, as we were worshipping, I, I just felt the Lord say, I'm doing something new. So I'll just give him a bit more space.
and in 1989 they, they felt that God was saying that he's doing something new in Isaiah 43 and verse 19 and in the message version it says this forget about what's happened don't keep going over old history be alert be present I'm about to do something brand new it's bursting out don't you see it what a vision so, as we come to pray, we pray for our world and our community and our church. And just remember that God is always wanting to make all things new. Thank you. Thanks. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the world. There's so much that makes, it's, it's, when I look around the world, there's so much to make you despair. But then we know that God is God and he has the last word. When I say Lord in your mercy, you may want me to run in that day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessing to us. We thank you for the rain to water the ground and be filled with the reservoirs, but thank you too that the sun has returned to cheer us. We pray for your church in this town, and especially the Christ Church, for our leaders, Richard and Kathleen, Alex and Emma and me, and also for Tim, Sam and Abby and Teddy. We pray they will be able to enjoy some rest over the summer. We pray you will guide and bless the preparation for September, when everything starts back up again, and that you will continue to work in our midst, and that we will respond to your leading us. We pray you will guide our Indian church leaders in the preparations for the new term, and that you will give inspiration about what to prepare, and that there will be sufficient people to care for the young people you have given us. We pray too that there will be sufficient people coming forward to fill the gaps so no one is overburdened. We pray you will be close to all those who face a change next month or in the near future, for those starting school, moving schools, starting college or university, and those starting work or moving jobs. We ask you to be close to them and that they will not fear the unknown, but know deep down that you are there with them. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our nation where there is so much darkness. We pray your Holy Spirit will draw men to you. In this respect, we pray you will bless the rally in London later this month with Frank and Wayne bringing the good news of Jesus. We ask that many will be affected and drawn to you through this occasion. Now, Father, we pray for our government that they will govern with justice and compassion in all the conflicting issues they have to deal with. We pray for the right decisions to be made with regard to the many people who arrive in this country from situations of war, of persecution, or extreme poverty, where they may have lost everything due to drought or floods or both. We ask that they will be met with kindness and that they will meet with you. We pray for the response to the climate emergency and that it will be recognised as such and that all of us may make the right choices within our abilities to stop things getting any worse, and especially those in positions of power. In this respect, we pray that the wildfires and the extreme heat and drought which caused them will ease and that, they, that we will learn from these. Especially we pray for rain to continue in this country more regularly and to come gently in southern Europe. We pray for those affected this week by the wildfires in Hawaii both those who have been bereaved and the men who lost homes, businesses and jobs. May we get the help they need and be able to start again. Lord, in your mercy, we are pray. We pray now for our Christian brothers and sisters who have been persecuted, that Christians in Bennu and throughout the world from the central Nigeria will know your strength and comfort as they face ongoing persecution for militants. We pray for healing for the injured and traumatised, and that the men who have fled their homes will be provided for. We pray, Father, for an end to the group of two decades long persecution of Christians in Nigeria. We ask for your comfort and provision for all those affected by the recent violence in Manipur State in India, particularly for the traumatised and displaced, and that the bereaved believers in Manipur would know your comfort and would remain strong in their faith. Father, we pray for the pastors and church leaders 
in southeastern Ukraine who are living under Russian occupation. Protecting Ukraine strengthened their faith as they face restrictions and imprisonment. But thank you too for the many Ukrainian people who have turned to you since the conflict there began. We pray that many more in that country will turn to you as Saviour and Lord. Most of all, Father, we pray for just peace in that country. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we pray for all those we know who are unwell in whatever way, and also for those who are bereaved, whether we speak or some will go. We name them before you now. May they know comfort, compassion from others and healing we pray. Especially now we live to you, Barbara's family, as we too mourn her loss from this congregation. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. And now the prayer that Jesus taught us. <coughs> our, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your will be done on earth. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much, Jill, for leading us in our intercessions. And just uh, if you didn't know, uh, Barbara, that who Jill prayed for, Barbara Craddock, one of our pastoral assistants here for many years, passed away um, last week. Um, funeral details are not yet known, but please do pray for um, her family at this time. So the most important part of the service, the notices. <laughs> Got just a couple of notices um, this morning. Um, the first is this is for all the men in the room. We're having a men's breakfast. Oh, we should we should be going. Oh, come on, give me an oh. So, ladies, if you'd like to do a ladies' lunch, I'm sure we can try and arrange that as well. I think that would be good. I just felt cold this past week as I gathered with. Um, we were away in, in Devon and um, all of the, the male cousins um, went for a breakfast and I thought, it's actually really good because we just put the world to rights. And uh, So we're going to have it on, I think, on the 3rd of September, is that right? Oh, second, second, Saturday the 2nd at Michael what time? I'm great, I've forgotten. No, sometime in the morning. At Weatherspoons in Dartford. It was in your email. Um, I should have got the details. But we'll continue to email you. So just book in there so we know who's coming. Um, just an hour or so. Um, vegetarian options are available if you don't like sausages. Um, we went away, uh, about 62 of us in total visited New Wine. When, yeah, if we had, if we came to New Wine? Yeah, we did a day. We had a wonderful barbecue. We had eight of our young people. Young people, where are you? So, come we had we had some of you. Some of you here, well, at least three of you here. Um, and we, it was a wonderful time to come together with hundreds of other churches from around the country. Um, to see what God is doing in the nation, to see what God is doing, especially amongst the young people, is incredible. You've got young people coming into a tent, okay, you could not make this up. The lights and everything, you just, you know, just, it, was, it was like walking into a tabernacle, you just see them kneeling and worshipping the Lord. They weren't told to do this, you know, I was stood there one day um, and just watching it and I was like, God, what are you doing? This is just incredible. So keep on praying for our young people. Um, but we want to encourage you to book on for next year's new wine, which is not going to be in Maidstone, but sunny Somerset. Oh, not really 
interesting. That's the Welsh showground. Um, here is a video just to whet your appetite. Oh, George, tell us a bit about new wine, Ace and Wine. Well, I think this is quite significant for England, for this country. The Lord told us that it would have national repercussions, and I believe the Lord is going to do great things. Started as a whisper, message from a new world I'd never know. Something about it felt like I've been waiting my whole life. Is this home? I can hear each sound calling my name, and I feel angels around when I start to sing. And suddenly it feels like heaven is a song for you. Tell me, can you hear the sound of the music? Can be still and know that I am God. Can just ca 
capture something of God in, in just our ordinary everyday lives. So that was mind blowing. And then um, we had a lovely, cosy, warm welcome um, from Jill and Michael in their camper van, which was very welcome. And then the, in the afternoon, I spent the afternoon session with Emma and Chloe in the crèche, which was which was real, you know, which was which was our future, you know. There I was crawling around the floor with them, and, and I really loved that. And and that's the second thing I came away with. That yes, I know I personally would like to hear more of God's voice and have, and have the gift of prophecy. Maybe that sounds a bit highfalutin. I'm really stupid, I don't know, but I would like to. But we can all pray for our, our little ones. And I know I pray for my great, our grandchildren all the time. But we can all do that. You know, and in this crash, it's filled with little ones. And Teddy came up to us, and, and Samuel, uh, Samuel Foote, who was here last year with his parents, she's a worship and I just thought, as a church, whether we've got children or grandchildren or not, we, uh, as I think you were saying, that we can all, they're, they're our future, and we can all pray that they're surrounded by God's love, His protection, and that they all come to know the Lord in their lives. So that's the second thing I came away with. And then after that, we had Alex's amazing barbecue, Sharon and Norma and Colin out. It was it, and even the sun came out. Just very briefly, but hey, that sun came out, didn't it, you? That sun came out. And then after that, we had the most amazing worship session. And, 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 and I know, however we worship God, you know, in, in, in that, like, our beautiful worship today, on our traditional hymns, that's what he wants us to do, worship him. And it, but not only did I felt I really worship God, you know, I was blessed through that. And despite the rain and wind, that stayed with me all week. So that's what I came away with. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Let's give her a round of applause. And my interviewee actually walked in the door. Sebastian, do you want to come up? I did warn you about this. You don't have to. Oh, he's coming. Come on, give him a go. Let's give him a go. Sebastian, so you came to New Wine, um, specifically what part of New Wine did we go to? New Wine? Luminosity. Luminosity. It was very good. It was very good. And um, what happened at Luminosity? What did we do every day? We worshipped, um, we got closer to God, we had new information, that was very nice. I got closer to God and I really liked it as well. And um, if there's one thing, you said that you got closer to God, but if there's one thing that might have changed your kind of um, faith journey from last week, what would it be? Or what would you, what was your biggest takeaway? Um, it was like the last one, when the, that woman said about passion. Yeah, I like that. It really took me that I had to believe in God, the faith. So I believed in more because before I didn't used to like believe it as much, but like now it got me very close to God. Wonderful. Let's give Sebastian. <laughs> the Lynn might have to correct me, but the biggest thing for the young people was being being a change maker. So leaving luminosity which was the youth festival within the new wine, but being a change maker for Jesus. So, and that was one week, and, we, and as a church we took a hit, we, we, we went with it, we, we cooked so much food. I've never seen so many jumbo sausages on a barbecue. Oh, anyway, we had to eat, in fact, some of them were in our freezers. If anyone wants sausages, but it, it was an investment, an investment for the kingdom especially with our young people. And, um, even Teddy, he's, he's, he's now talking about the cross. And I'm like, a three-year-old who knows more about Golgotha than I do. Um, so, yeah, New Wine is um, next year. Come and talk to us, um, get booking, because um, it will be an incredible time together. Because something extraordinary happens when the church family gets together.
So we're going to receive our offering now, and it's a prayer that we say that should come up on the screen. We give at Christ Church in many ways, through our time and through our service, but also through our money. Um, and we can give in cash or online. So we, we pray and give thanks for all of that. So let's say this prayer together. We offer you, Lord, these are the this saying, you should always check your tech before you do a talk. So for most, the uh, books of the Old Testament might as well be Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Because when it comes to the book of Leviticus, for many, the Bible starts to get boring. I can see a few people yawning already. 
It's easy to understand why, because it's very difficult to read. It's uh, for three main reasons. A Bible scholar called David Paulson says this. He would say that it is quite simply a boring book. It's like trying to read the telephone directory. Do they even exist anymore? Uh, yellow page. You can't stand on it to kiss your girlfriend anymore. You know, get that, that advert. I love that. It's like, um, so it is so different in content from the other books of the Bible. It's, and a bit of numbers as well, which we're going to come on to next week. Especially um, the first two books of the Bible, which are full of stories. Noah's Ark, the garden, all that kind of stuff. In those books there is plot, there is drama, things are moving. But when we get to Leviticus, there's hardly any narrative at all. And since many regard the whole Bible as a collection of stories, it is a great disappointment to arrive at a book which has no stories of any kind. The second reason why we find it difficult is because what we read in Leviticus is so unfamiliar. It is from a different culture as well as having a different content. By reading it, we're moving away from our present situation by 3,000 years and 2,000 miles. It's a totally different world. And we read about things that we find very strange. For example, consider the way that they deal with infectious disease in Leviticus. The poor person has to tear their clothes, let their hair grow long, and be unbrushed cover their lower part of their face and go around shouting, UNCLEAN! UNCLEAN! It's a bit weird, isn't it? I think we deal with infectious diseases rather differently. The third reason it's difficult is that it seems to be so irrelevant to what um, Leviticus has got to say to us today. How relevant is it to my workplace on Monday? How relevant is it to my neighbour? Deep down we know instinctively that we are not under the law of Moses and since this book is part of his law, we're not sure what, if anything, it has to do with us. And the overall content of Leviticus covers a lot of stuff. Five major offerings to God, how to handle the offerings, the establishment of the priesthood, the laws on cleanness and uncleanness, the day of atonement ritual, are you still with me? The handling and meaning of blood, the call to holiness, holy times, blessings and curses, and vows and dedication. You all know it, don't you, off my heart? So with that in mind, if you fail to come to church today without a pigeon or a lamb, that we can sacrifice up there on the altar, you failed the Levitical code. What else are we going to do today? We actually see that all as weird. Joking aside, Leviticus is kind of weird because it's not what we're used to today. But God speaks through his scripture. No matter what the context or location, We can always learn more from Scripture as we dig deeper into God's Word, and He reveals more of His plan for us through it via His Holy Spirit. Amen. This Bible scholar, David Pawson, says this. He says, when we read the Old Testament, it can be helpful to imagine that we are Jewish. It's helpful to imagine their context and where they were at the time of it being written. Because for a Jewish person, the reason for reading Leviticus is clear. It's quite literally a matter of life or death. To the Jews, there is only one God, and that is the God of Israel. All other so-called gods are figments of human imagination. And it was the same for the Israelites in Exodus and Leviticus. Since there is only one God, and they were his people on earth, there was a special relationship between him and them. And on God's side, he promised to do so many things for them, to be their government, to be their minister of defence, to 
protect them, to be their minister's finance, so there would be no poor among them, to be their minister of health, so that none of the diseases of Egypt would touch them. So it was a matter of life and death for the, the Jews at the time. God would be everything they needed, their king, and in return he expected them just to live a right life, to do things right. Righteousness means living right. And when we read Leviticus, we hear the Lord tell us, Be holy, for I am holy. God expects the people he liberates to be like him, and not like those around them. Many of the puzzling things in Leviticus are explained by that fact. God just wants us to be like him. He is holy, so he wants us to be holy. That's the key of unlocking this book of rules and regulations. When God tells them, to, them that they must do something, it's because the people around them are doing something different. And he's calling his people to be holy because of his home. The whole book of Leviticus helps us in our journey to be more like God, and it can be separated into two main themes. The first half up to chapter 16 is about justification. Another word is the way to God. How can we get close to God? The second half, chapters 16 to 27, is about sanctification, which is your walk with God. How do we walk with God in our lives? The book shares four things. The first is the holiness of God. There's no other book in the Bible which is stronger on the holiness of God. We learn to love God with reverence and a holy fear. It talks about the sinfulness of man. It strongly underlines the sinfulness of man as well as the holiness of God. Here is human nature capable of so many abominations. That word abomination, which means something that you want to be physically sick because you're so disgusted by it. The Bible is about God's emotions. His emotional reaction to sin comes because he is holy. The sinfulness of man is not just in polluting clean things, but also violating holy things, which must be really difficult because he wants us to be holy like he is holy. Leviticus points to the fullness of Christ and his sacrifice once and for all, so that all of those unclean things, all the things we've done wrong, can be wiped clean. That cleansing of sin from mankind. And finally, Leviticus shares the godliness of life. It tells us to be holy in every part of our lives, even down to our toilet arrangements. You've read that book, right? Holiness is wholeness, which is why we can read of the incredible detail God goes into as he applies his holiness to every part of his people's lives. It tells us that a godly life is godly through and through, or it's not godly at all. So Leviticus is what could be described as the most profitable book for Christians to read. It gives us insight into those four vital things, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the fullness of Christ, and the godliness of life. But how does that relate to us here today? How does that speak to us? What is God saying? Well, I've shared a bit about new wine, but so far this summer um, we've been away to uh, another festival called Focus up in Nottingham, and then we've been straight to new wine. And, and there's two key themes that I feel has been running throughout both of those events. I feel that God is talking to us about holiness, which is quite interesting that today's scripture was Leviticus, the holiness code.
There's a lot to process when you go to these big events, but two things have spoken to me and I'd like to share with them today. So the first theme is getting it right with God, returning to Him. But returning to Him in a way like we mean it. One preacher of one of these events said, the days of cheap worship have gone. When it comes to living our lives as Christians and worshipping God, somewhere, somehow, we, the church, his people, have got into a bit of a mess. And outside of the church, society is in an even bigger mess. There's still praying all of those issues in the world that are going on, the wars, Issues with our identity, issues with homelessness, issues with substance abuse. We are in a mess. And one of the things that comes from Leviticus and other parts of the Bible is, is this word fear of the Lord. This phrase fear of the Lord, which for some of us feels like, oh, we must really fear him and, and yeah, we can't do anything because he's going to be angry at us. But actually, we must come to God with a wholehearted devotion. Simon Ponsonby was one of our speakers at New Wine, and he's the pastor of theology. What a, what a title. Can I be called pastor of theology? No, I'm not good. But he's the pastor of theology at St. Aldate's in Oxford, and he shared this at New Wine that he sees that the Holy Spirit has been doing some wonderful things in the past 60 years. Charismatic renewal, fresh expressions of church and worship. It's been a great time to re energize the church, but there's something that we might have lost, and that is the fear of the Lord. As I said, the fear of the Lord is, is something not to be scared of, but could be better understood as delighting in the Lord because He is awesome. He's the Creator. Be amazed by God. He is wonderful. The well-known song, but I don't know how to love him, from the musical Jesus Christ Superstar hits the nail on the head when understanding our relationship with God. We don't know how to love him. We don't know how to be in his presence. So as people of God, his church, we have prioritised program over presence. It's about what we do, not about who we are. It's about how we do things, not about who he is and what he's doing amongst us. The fear of the Lord is something to behold, to delight in. Why is it important? Well, sin appears when the fear of the Lord disappears. When we lose the fear of the Lord, we start to please other people. We begin to care more about what other people think than we do about what the Lord thinks. And Leviticus, a lot of the rest of the Bible teaches us to fear the Lord, not man. How often does your fear of man overrule your fear of God? How often does when somebody says, oh, you know, when you think they think something of you, how much does that control you over what you believe God thinks about you? Holiness comes from the fear of the Lord. Presence and closeness with God comes from the fear of the Lord. When you come to the Lord, do you feel like kneeling because of his awesome presence? Do you ever weep in his overwhelming presence? Do you ever have the sense that, God, you are really big and God, I am really small? Is that having that kind of healthy fear, that adoration? That feeling of kneeling in front of your God and Maker, which is the essence of the Christian life. So we need to relearn how to approach our God and Creator. Pray for the fear of the Lord every day. Every revival in the church has been marked with that healthy fear of the Lord. If you remember, I spoke earlier on this year about the Hebridean revival. Duncan Campbell was called to one of the islands and he was there to stay a short time. Well, God came down and he stayed there for three years. 
from that revival came many, many blessings. When we've regained the fear of the Lord, we will find that being holy becomes more attractive and easier to achieve because the key point, the pressure is off. Because the pressure is off and it leads us to knowing who we are and knowing that he is the creator. Which leads me to my second point, the second thing that I feel God is um, calling us to understand. And I heard this in actually the youth festival in Luminosity. Our identity is in God through Christ Jesus, nothing else. Our identity is in God through Christ Jesus, nothing else. The holiness we hear about in today's reading, at chapter 19, verse 1 to 4, refers first and foremost to the essential nature of God. He is holy. And the term holy means set apart. Just like in that beginning video of Book Denver and Pastor, was it Pastor P or something? We don't just pull our mashed potatoes to one side, but we set ourselves apart for a purpose, to be distinct and unique. Set ourselves apart for the service of God. Human holiness is the imitation of God. We become and act more like Him. Our identity is in Him through Christ Jesus, not in our image, not in our social media profile, not in our gender. Our image is not in our sexuality, but it's in Jesus. And again, once we know this, the pressure is off. Because we know who we're called to be and we know how we're called to be. Holy like God is holy. And God wants us to live lives that are pure and clean. That's why Leviticus rolls off all of these things about how to know, be healthy and whole and, um, again, how to go to the toilet. When we're pure and clean like God, we are, we reflect who He is, and thereby we're able to point people to Him. And to keep your heart pure, you need to turn away from the things that spoil your life. Know that you are created in God's image. You're created to reflect His holiness. You're created to point people towards Him. When we know our identity in Him, we don't point to other things. And we don't um, try and cover things up by other things. Verse 4, do not put your trust in idols or make metal images of gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. Spend time in his word, kneel before your God and creator, come to know him more and your identity as a son or daughter will become, I am the son and daughter of the Lord Almighty, I've got nothing to fear because I'm in his presence. Emma bought me a little bookmark of new wine and it had all these little fish on it and there was one fish that was red, the rest were white. And it said under it, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what does Leviticus teach us? Well, it teaches us to fear the Lord, not to forget his awesomeness, his amazing bigness, not to forget that we're actually really small, but that's okay because our presence, our, sorry, our identity is in Him. Leviticus teaches us that when we put our identity in Him, we can set ourselves apart for His will and His glory and for the sake of this world. Friends, I wonder if you stand with me as we just try to digest whatever it is you might have got from that talk. As we try to digest and dig deep into God's scripture, 
especially these books of the Pentateuch, these, these really old books that might not feel very relevant to us. I wonder if you've thought of this fear of the Lord being, we must be scared of God. I wonder if God is saying to you today, don't be scared, but just be amazed at what I've done for you. And I wonder if for some of us it is our Instagram profile, it is our identity that, that we don't have in Christ. Our identity is in something else. And actually that stresses us out quite a bit. And if, if that's for you today, just remember it's not in the Instagram, it's not in what other people think about you, it's about being holy for the Lord. It's about becoming more like Him. It's about setting your lives apart for His kingdom and His glory. That's why we're here today, friends. That's why we're at church. To be reminded of God's holiness. Let us just wait on the Lord, and as we wait, we just welcome the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, we pray. Some people find it useful to put their hands out in front of them as a physical sign to say, Lord, I want to be more holy. I want to receive more of you, I want to become more of you. Others might want to sit down and, and, and just soak in his presence. So we just wait a while. And let God just minister to us. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, send your Holy Spirit upon your sons and daughters here today.
just going to continue to worship the King. We're going to continue to worship God Almighty. So let's all stand together. If you're still being meeting with the Lord, if you're still being ministered to, continue to let Him do a work in your life. We're going to sing and celebrate the goodness of God. Because He is holy, He is perfect, He is awesome.